better. I didn't touch anything, I swear. Oh, Ty, what did you do? It wasn't my fault. Okay, for today's edition of Breaking the Internet, this video comes to us from Now This, and I've done video rebuttals of them before. Here we've had it come back around, and so I wanted to go ahead and show you some of these. We're, we're going to do a video rebuttal of a Now This video. What would it look like to be a church that looked like the movement that Jesus started and not like church that we know in America today. Out of that consistent questioning came this model for a brewery church that generates funds for local charities. Uh <laughs> As soon as I saw that guy again, because again, I, I said that I'd seen this video about a year ago and then it just recently resurfaced. I think I may have based Gregory Post off of this guy. I really do. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know my, my Social Justice Warrior Bible videos, the, the pastor in that video, the character that I play is named Gregory Post. I think I based my look off of this guy and didn't realize it. Maybe it was subconscious, but y you look, you've got the, the arm tattoos You've got even the hat. Gregory Post wears a hat almost identical to that one, and I didn't even realize it. So there's a few other influences coming from other places, but the big thick glasses, the sort of hipster look, I think I may have accidentally uh, sort of borrowed my inspiration from Gregory Post off of the guy in this video, and the, it fits because the church is pretty much as legitimate as the eternal living word transdenominational uh, community church in uh, in California there for th from those sketches. Uh, <laughs> it, in other words, it's, it's just as much a church as that one is, and, and I made that one up. First of all, I will say it's a good premise, horrifically bad execution. I mean, it's like saying, I really want to hit that target with an arrow. Okay, that's a pretty good starting point. And then you turn around and shoot a grandma. Like, that's how bad the execution is. That's how far off you are. You wound up shooting in the opposite direction and hurting somebody in the process of doing it. But anyway, uh, fraught with theological issues there. The, the premise, though, that we want to form a church that looks more like the church that Jesus formed as opposed to the ones that Americans are more accustomed to, the, the kind that has been sort of created in the American culture, the, the one that people are typically expecting, that's not a bad premise. It's really not. I mean, if we're talking about going back to the way that Jesus Christ lived, going back to the first century church, living the way that the Christians did in the book of Acts and trying to worship and emulate our lives the way that, that they live, the direct followers of Christ, 100% in favor of that. Could not be more on board with that. It's literally my life's mission to do that. But they kind of missed the mark here by an awful lot. Because here's the problem. I understand that you, you may have some gripes with the way that churches are in America, and I do too. I've talked about them on this program quite a bit. But there's a difference in being different for the sake of being different and being different because it's right. I think what's going on here is they're saying there's an issue with churches in America. Okay, on board with that. Let's talk about the criticisms. Let's think, let's think about this. Let's go back to the Bible as our standard. Compare that to the modern iteration of the church and figure out where the issues are. If that's what you're talking about, yeah, completely on board. But what seems to happen is they said, okay, what the church is doing now, the, the way that the church is in America, there's some problems with it. So let's try to do exactly the opposite of every single thing that they're doing, and then we'll be fine. No, that's not how it works. If you want to think critically about anything, you look at it and say, okay, I can see some pros and cons. Or if you do just see only cons or only pros, you have to be able to logically explain why that is. These guys seem to, well, let's just try to be the opposite of every church we've ever heard of, and then we'll be fine. That's not the way that this works. Go back to the standard of the scripture, and that is what ought to be your guide. 
And if you do that, there are going to be some significant noticeable differences in you and the modern idea of what most people think of as a church. But it's not going to look like this because the Bible specifically denounces a lot of the things that you're talking about. First of all, and I think this one's pretty obvious, I don't remember Jesus ever selling beer to people to raise money for charity. I mean, raising money for charity is all well and good, and I'm an, I'm a fan of it, but using alcohol to get there isn't really the correct way because uh, some people will try to rebut that. as like, well, the money's going to a good cause. Well, could you just raise money selling porn videos? I, I mean, because if the money's going to a good cause, then why does it matter what you're selling? Well, it does matter what you're selling right now. So let's go ahead and look at this one from Titus 2, 14 through 15. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove all authority. Let no one disregard you. Charity, by the Bible's definition, is not poor people get stuff. It's not. Because let's look at that verse one more time. Because it talks about charity. But look at what the pur purpose is. These things speak and exhort and approve with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So we're supposed to be charitable and to be zealous of good deeds. To do what? To gain us credibility so that we may preach the truth to people. See, these guys seem to have, and by the way, their definition of charity is a little shaky, and I'm going to get to that here in a second. But the issue here is, they're just giving to people for the sake of giving to people. It's just like, well, we like to help people. That's a good sentiment to have. We like to help people, therefore we're going to gather up money and give it to them. If your church is not based on truth, if it is not based on the rock-solid foundation of the Scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ, then no amount of good works you do does any good, because the purpose of good works in the first place is to let people see a little bit of God shining through you so that you may convey the truth to them. This church has absolutely no basis in the gospel, no basis in truth whatsoever. I'm not saying they don't do any good things, even though if you look at the list of the charities they give to, their definition of charities is pretty questionable. But even if that weren't the case, even if all of these causes were good, noble, just causes, you would still run into the issue of you're not doing charity for the purpose for which it is intended in the Scripture, and that is to spread the message of Christ. That's not what you're doing here. And furthermore, I'm not the kind of person, like I said, that always thinks that every consumption of alcohol is always a sin, no matter how it's consumed or how much is consumed, but the fact that they're using alcohol to raise money for this and serving it in their worship service is a pretty big concern. So let's look at Habakkuk 2, 15 through 16. Woe to you who make neighbors drink, who mix in your venom, even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around you, and will utter disgrace will come upon your glory. Now I want you to notice, not only is drunkenness and drinking being repudiated in and of itself, but what's important to understand about that scripture is it specifically says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. Like I said, I can understand using an alcoholic beverage if you want to, if you know where your limits are and you know that you can take a little bit and not get drunk. I don't see an issue with having an adult beverage with dinner or something like that. But specifically, giving things to people, being a distributor of alcohol, seems to be pretty, I mean, pretty obviously a violation of what was going on just there. Specifically because it was being done in worship and being done as, as a part of the worship, which was really strange. And along those same lines, let's also consider Nadab and Abihu. For those of you that are unfamiliar, 
Nadab and Abihu were the sons of Aaron, the high priest. And what happened is, when this big worship service was coming and Aaron was the high priest presiding over the worship of God in the synagogue, his sons, who were also priests, Nadab and Abihu, they disobeyed the Lord and they brought him strange fire. And what's so fascinating about this story is that unless you really understand and, and put two and two together, you may miss one of the big messages from the story. Because, of course, disobedience to God, regardless of what state of mind you are in when that happens, is something that is not to be tolerated. And God makes that pretty clear throughout the scripture. But there's one particular part that I want you to, to pay attention to, because this is in that same chapter directly after we see the story of Nadab and Abihu where they offered the strange fire and God killed them for being disobedient to him in worship. And, and look at God's rationale for why he decided it was best to end their life in this particular situation. So this is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 10, verse 9. This is the Lord speaking. Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you will not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And so the thing is there, you don't exactly have to be a Bible scholar to put two and two together here. We've just had two men disobey God in worship, who were slain in front of God and everybody else. The whole nation of Israel saw this and heard about it. And God consumed them with fire. And they had to drag the bodies out. This was a huge ordeal. And then immediately after, we get a lecture on drinking in worship. And we even have a little bit further down, further explanation from God saying, I will be respected, I will be treated as holy. And so, because these verses are butted right up next to each other, and it seems to be a continuation of the story, it would be really odd to get a lecture on not drinking in worship right after this event. It seems sort of out of place unless you put two and two together and say, ah, what was going on was Nadab and Abihu they did make a bad decision, and that bad decision would have been bad whether they were sober or drunk. But it seems that their judgment was impaired because they had been consuming alcohol. And part of God's reaction to this was, I will be respected. I will be taken seriously in worship. And in that very verse that we just read, you come into the tent, you are ready to worship, and you are sober-minded, lest ye die. So, in other words, he was saying, if you want to end up like Nadab and Abihu, drink during my worship service. Again, I'm not somebody that thinks that it is a sin in every occasion where somebody partakes of an alcoholic beverage. I don't drink myself, never had a drop of alcohol in my life. But I can't look at a Bible verse and tell you, say, well, look there, drinking's a sin. Drunkenness is a sin, but drinking isn't. But you know what is a sin? Coming to worship God drunk. Coming and approaching his throne in an irreverent manner where you are not fully sober-minded and prepared to give your full attention and worship to your creator. That is a completely different scenario, and that's what they're doing in this church. They literally have a bar where they serve alcohol during their worship service. You can't get much closer to Nadab and Abihu than what these guys are doing right here. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this next clip. We are open and affirming LGBTQ. Uh, we are feminist, and I believe Jesus was too. We are environmentalist, which I believe that's the original mandate of of. Uh, the children of God to take care of the planet that we we all know and enjoy. We are anti-war, which I believe Jesus was too. Now, I find this very ironic that we're bringing this up because basically he goes through a long list of liberal talking points and tries to explain without giving any reason or backing whatsoever, just saying it is this way, therefore it is this way, circular reasoning. Uh, just saying, oh, it, that's that's the way it is. You want a Bible verse? Well, I can't give you that, but this is the way that it... So he's like, we're in favor of homosexuality. This is basically all of, um, not better or Pete Buttigieg's 
uh, campaign points all at once. He, he just gave a, a very concise summary of Pete Buttigieg, and I think that that's incredibly appropriate. So uh, here's the thing. You can be an atheist and argue that homosexuality is permissible. You can. In fact, I think it's the only way that you can. Because every religious tradition, at least Western religious tradition, teaches that it is incorrect. But you cannot be a Christian and say that something that the Bible very explicitly and obviously says is wrong, it's sinful, it's an abomination against God, all of those things, you cannot claim to be a follower of the Bible, a follower of Jesus Christ, and say it's not a sin and, and we're fine with it. Can't do both. You gotta pick one. And by the way, I'm not singling out homosexuality. That would be true for heterosexual sins, sex before marriage, adultery. Uh, it would be true of non-sexual sins, lying, pride, wh whatever you want to bring up, whatever sin that you would like to bring to the forefront. If you're saying that Jesus says it's a sin, but I'm saying it's okay, you cannot call yourself a Christian, a follower of Christ, and do that. Can't be done. If you do that, then you are simply not a Christian. For examples of this, this is true all throughout the Scripture, and we're not going to read every single one, I'm just going to sort of rapid-fire these. In the Old Testament, Genesis 19, Sodom is destroyed, not entirely, but in part because of the sin of homosexuality. And the Bible makes that explicitly clear. The two men go in uh, to Lot's house, who happen to be angels. The men of Sodom gather around there, asking to have their way with them. Lot, stupidly in my opinion, even offers him their daughters instead so that they will not sin. And they say, no, no, we want the men. We want to have sex with them. So Sodom was so encased in homosexuality, and that city was so evil that God literally wiped them from the face of the earth with fire from heaven. Uh, we go to Leviticus 18.26. It specifically mentions homosexuality as an abomination against God and grounds for exile. You were to be, as the Bible says, cut off from your people if you engaged in that sin. wasn't the only sin that was like that. There were several other sins that you could be exiled for. Again, I'm not trying to single out homosexuality as some kind of big super sin. I'm just saying that because it is a sin in establishing that point, that you cannot say that you are a follower of Christ if you embrace it. You can go all throughout the New Testament. Romans 1, it refers to homosexuality as a vile passion and saying that God gave them over to their own depraved minds, talking about those who engage in homosexuality. 1 Corinthians 6, homosexuals cannot enter heaven. By the way, it gives a laundry list of other sins that will also keep you out of heaven. And what's amazing about that is, keep in mind, Corinth, a Greek city where homosexuality was prominent. One of the things that Paul says in there is, such as some of you were. In other words, there were former homosexuals in the first century church. People that engaged in homosexual activity, probably all kinds of other illicit sexual activity, because it mentions fornicators in that same list there. So that being the case, this is not something that the Bible is saying you can never recover from or that once you're homosexual, you're just out and God has no use for it. That's not what it's saying at all. Just like any other sin, it is saying there is an opportunity for reformation here. So, yeah, you should be embracing of homosexuals, but not their homosexuality. You can embrace the sinner without embracing the sin and telling them that their lifestyle is okay. That's not something that the Bible would ever advocate for. And then, of course, you got passages like 1 Timothy 1, where it says that the law is made to reform the immoral. And one of the, one of the immoral acts that it lists is homosexuality. So again, in the New Testament, these things are always listed with the caveat, not even the caveat, that's not even the right word, but with the addendum of, Yes, these things are horrible and will keep you away from God's presence, but that bridge can still be gapped through Jesus Christ. No matter what sin it is, you can still come to Christ and turn away from your evil ways, leave your old lifestyle behind you, and come to a fuller understanding of spirituality with Him. That's always the way that it's presented. Jude 7 talks about Sodom and Gomorrah specifically and said that they sought after strange flesh and that the ones that share in those same desires, will share in the same fate. 
again, Jude still gives the idea that you can reform yourself from that, that it is not too late, but it does talk about the same principles that were being presented in the Old Testament. And then, of course, there's Matthew 19, where Jesus very clearly defines marriage as one man and one woman, and what God has put together let not man separate. He gives a definitive uh, explanation of what marriage is, what it was always intended to be, and therefore is saying anything that would not be this is not allowed. That would be two men, two women, any kind of uh, polygamous situation, anything that would involve kids, because he says man and woman, he doesn't say children. He says man and woman, so people of consenting age, they come together and what God has joined, let not man separate which would mean that anything that does not fit that one definition that Jesus gives in Matthew 19 is not acceptable in God's eyes. Let's move on to the second point. Jesus was a feminist. Look, if we're talking about respecting women, yeah, I would go along with that. If we're talking about classical feminism, I don't think that that's an incorrect stance to take. Jesus was a feminist in that sense. I mean, you look at the way that he he treated various women, um, but if you're talking about some kind of fourth generation, men suck, uh, kill the patriarchy, and, and I have a right to murder my child in the womb, that kind of feminism, that's not Christianity at all. Women in the scripture, by the way, by the followers of Christ, are commanded to dress modestly. 1 Timothy 2.9 Women are also to be in subject, uh, subjugation in the home, Ephesians 5, and in worship, 1 Corinthians 14.34 which, by the way, all of this is done with the understanding that men have the greater sacrifice to make, that we are to love women to the point that we are to give ourselves for them like Christ gave the church, uh, gave himself for the church. So if you're asking, if you're a man hearing those verses and thinking, ooh, I got the easy job, uh, no, you didn't. Our calling is to love women and protect them in the way that Christ gave himself for the church. Believe me, we do not have the easier task when it comes to that. And it's not a competition and shouldn't be seen that way. But even including all of that, understanding all of those things, those are things that a fourth wave feminist, like I'm assuming he is based on his policies, that's something that a fourth wave feminist would never consent to. And yet, the scripture is a very pro-woman book, not just for its time, but for for today, by today's standards. You look at some of the amazing women in the Bible, Tabitha, Chloe, Mary, other Mary, the other other Mary, uh, Priscilla, Martha, uh, you just go on and on, and those are just the ones from the New Testament. That's not even counting Esther and Ruth and Abigail and all the other prominent figures from the Old Testament. I mean, if you want to make the case that Jesus was a person who respected women, who valued their contributions then yeah, I, I think that anybody that has read the story of the woman caught in adultery or the story of the woman in the well can quickly figure out that he was that kind of person. He didn't try to take advantage of women. He didn't treat them as second-class citizens. But the idea that he was some kind of feminist in the way that most people understand feminism now, uh, with these protesters walking around naked saying, free the boobs and uh, saying that I have the right to kill my baby in my womb— Sorry, that's not going to fly. There's no evidence of that anywhere in the scripture. Uh, another one that he, he brings up, Jesus was an environmentalist. Well, not really part of his mission. And we actually did quite a bit on this. If you'll look, uh, I think it was the most recent episode that we did where we were talking about Judge and his stance on environmentalism. And because of that, I won't rehash that much more. But suffice it to say that I think that Jesus was somebody that would have honored the command that was originally given in the scripture to Adam, but it doesn't seem to me like he's real worried about the plants and the trees and the forest. He didn't die on the cross for them. He died on the cross for human beings. And so there's really not a whole lot of, there's not much of an argument to be had here just because Jesus doesn't really talk about it much. Um, and then finally, Jesus is anti-war. Well, I don't know of anybody that's not anti-war, really. I mean, you, you may occasionally throughout history have a handful of warmongers that 
knew that they were never going to fight or they felt that they were untouchable and because of that wanted war. But that's pretty uncommon amongst anybody in any religion. So the whole anti-war thing, I mean, every person that I'm aware of that I can think of off the top of my head doesn't like war. Nobody likes war. So let's go ahead and look at the next clip here. We are all for racial justice, which Jesus was a Palestinian Jewish rabbi. He was a person of color that was killed by white supremacy. So we're usually making every effort to be on the front lines for racial justice. So that's what sets us apart from many American churches. Okay, so this is something that I've thoroughly debunked in past videos, but I'm going to go a little more in depth on this one. This is a lie that has been repeated by Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, a lot of people on the left, they always try to co-op Jesus and make him into something that fits their narrative as opposed to what he actually was. And by the way, it's wrong when people on the right do that, too. I, I've seen people on the right that try to co-op Jesus and make him into some kind of, I don't know, GOP activist or something like that. And that's not right either. But here's the irony in all of that. Um, the same people that are saying that are upset that Jesus has been cast as a white person they're just rebranding Jesus into something that fits what they had, a preconceived notion of who Jesus was. So they're really not doing anything different than the people who want to think that he's a long, flowing-haired Italian guy. I mean, you're doing the same thing, you're just doing it in a different direction. It is. It takes real courage and real academic curiosity to see Jesus for who he really is, to pour through the scriptures on a daily basis and try to learn as much as you can about him to try to emulate your life after him. That's the way that you get a clear picture of Jesus, not by changing him into something else that's the opposite of what you think that he ought to be or, or what you think other people have made him into. You don't just make him the opposite for the sake of him being the opposite. You look at who he actually was. Again, their problem is they're trying to be different for the sake of being different, as opposed to being different because the scripture teaches something differently than the average church is teaching. So let's look into this claim that Jesus was a Palestinian rabbi of color. The earliest recorded use of the word Palestine comes from the 5th century BC and refers to the region of Syria, not Israel. Now granted, there was a time where Syria was in control of Israel, and by Israel, I mean specifically the northern kingdom. They never conquered the southern kingdom. So there was a time that at least parts of Israel, parts of what we understand to be the, the nation of Israel, both by Old Testament standards and today, that they were controlled by Syria. But it seems as though the authors that were using the word Palestine at the time were specifically referring to Syria, the Assyrian nation that was controlled by the Ninevites. That's what's being talked about right then. And several scholars do believe that it may have been used as early as 12th century BC and originating from Philista, which means the Philistines who controlled the land between Tel Aviv and Gaza. So the Philistines, we're very familiar with them if you've read any of your Old Testament. Those are the people that were a constant thorn in the side of the Israelites. In fact, David is the one who killed the giant Goliath, who was a Philistine, and Saul was killed by Philistines, King Saul was, along with his sons, including Jonathan. So the Philistines, this is probably derived from that word, Palestine, and the Greek scholars use that possibly as early as the 12th century BC. But here's the thing. If we're talking about Philistines, then we're not talking about Jesus. Because David was definitely not a Philistine, definitely not a Palestinian. And who is the progeny of David? Jesus. He is a direct descendant from King David. And so by any definition that you're looking, whether you're looking at the old one that is just referring to the Syrian nation specifically, or you're looking at the one that scholars believe people projected onto the Philistines and, and it was a reference to them, Either way that you're looking at the historic understanding of what it means to be Palestinian, Jesus would not be Palestinian. And by the way, it's important for us to remember that when you're looking at the northern kingdom, that does not include Jerusalem. So if you're wanting to use Palestine in that sense, you can't be somebody that says, oh, and they need to be occupying Jerusalem. Well, no, 
Even if you're really stretching the definition and saying, well, they would have meant also the regions of Israel that Syria was controlling at the time, even then, that still wouldn't have included Jerusalem. It still wouldn't have included the region of Judea and the southern kingdom, which was later taken over by the Babylonians. And so these people make these ridiculous claims because they want them to be true, but they haven't done any research to find out if they are actually true. Any way you look at it, Jesus was not a Palestinian. And the irony in all this is, if Jesus were a Palestinian, then the Jews are not occupying it. Because if Jesus, a Jewish man, is Palestinian, then there is no occupation of Palestine. All the Jews living there now are Palestinians too. So what's the fuss? They're saying this because they started with a political narrative they wanted to be correct, and they're trying to figure out a way to wirework the Bible around to make it fit their political narrative. Jesus Christ came to save the human race from the sin that it had committed. And you're trying to use him to make a political point? Finally, and this is the last point that I'll bring up on this, Jesus was killed by Romans at the behest of Jews, not white people. He said he was a Jewish Palestinian rabbi, which is an oxymoron in and of itself, and said that he was killed by white supremacy. Where are the white people in that story? Can, can you point them out to me? Because at that time, the Romans would have been Mediterranean, and they were only acting at the behest of the Jews, who were also not white. And so this is the absurdity they're saying, well, Jesus was a person of color. Jesus was Jewish. Yes. Well, who killed him? White supremacist. But the Jews killed him. Well, yeah. But you just said Jesus was Jewish and a person of color. Jesus can't both be a person of color and also be killed by white supremacy because his own people killed him. You can't have those two things at one time. They contradict one another. It's completely absurd. The assumption by a lot of people on the left is, if something bad happened, a white dude had something to do with it. We're not sure how, but white people are the source of all problems in the world. Therefore, if a bad thing happened, it must somehow be connected to white people. I mean, it's absurd, but that is really how some of them think. There were no white people in the, in the story of Jesus. None. There were no white people around that area, around that region. They would have all been either of Roman descent, Jewish descent, or from the nation surrounding them. In other words, Arabs. But there would have been absolutely no white people in that story. There was a time where white supremacists did come to Israel. That did happen. You know when it was? The 1930s. And do you know why? Because the Nazis, actual white supremacists, came into the region because they were on the same side as the Palestinians these people are trying to stick up for. They sided with the Nazis to help them exterminate Jews. So has there ever been white supremacy in Israel and in that region? Yeah, it has been there. But not in the time of Christ. It showed up much, much later at the welcome with open arms that was extended to them by the Arabs living there. Now, I don't think the Arabs living there now are necessarily to be held responsible for that because that's a really long time ago. Most of those people aren't living today. It's a completely different set of people. But my point in all of this is, you're trying to, to try to co-op Jesus into fitting some kind of political narrative because you don't like the way that Israel is running things in the country that they are currently in, in the region that they are operating in. And yet, we saw what that region looked like without the Jews in Israel, and it was a nation that was Open, openly embracing the Nazis, glad to have them there, wanted to help them in their mission to conquer the world and exterminate the Jewish race. That's the side that you're on. Think about that. All right, so let's look at the last clip and then we'll move on. said, 
hey, why can't we do a brewery and then we can use the space on Sunday before it opens to the public as a worship space. And then we can use the funds to give to local charities that people of all faiths, all sexual, all racial, uh, and even all faith identities can support. So we, we came up with this model and we found an awesome spot, consequently happens to be right below Planned Parenthood in Santa Cruz, which we adore and support their efforts for giving health care to women. This is not a gimmick at all to grow a huge, you know, Six Flags Over Jesus like we've got in every city in America. This is uh, just to do good work locally. All right, so the the takeaway from that has got to be the line where he's talking about how they're going to use the money raised by this church to give to Planned Parenthood and that we adore Planned Parenthood, we love what they do, providing health care to women. You would be better off giving to a satanic temple, donating your church money to a satanic ch- temple, than Planned Parenthood. Because at least at the satanic temple, they may talk about child sacrifice, but they're legally barred from doing it. Planned Parenthood is still engaging in it. All these years after paganism has allegedly died out, They're still making the same child sacrifices that angered God when they did it for Molech and with Baal. We're doing the same thing now. There isn't a cause more evil that you could give money to. And the fact that they're doing it in the name of God, I don't want to be standing anywhere near these people when Judgment Day comes. It just amazes me how they have so thoroughly convinced themselves that they are doing good while they are doing the work of the devil. It absolutely astounds me. It was common for Israel to be punished because they were supporting or allying with people who were engaged in child sacrifice. And these people will be no different. And what amazes me about this is that, again, I'm using the religious arguments because they are trying to make a religious argument in favor of Planned Parenthood. If you want to go back to the church that Jesus founded, why don't you remember that Jesus was a survivor of infant genocide? You remember that in the book of Luke and in the book of Matthew, that King Herod tried to kill Jesus by killing thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of children because he feared Jesus' power. He feared that he would rise up and and be a rival to his authority. And the only way that he could think of was let's just go house to house and kill the children. That's what Planned Parenthood does, not because they're afraid that the kids are going to rise up and become a king, but they're engaged in the same practice either way. And it just amazes me that they think that they're doing this in the name of Christ when Christ himself barely escaped the horrors that Planned Parenthood is now openly doing with the authority of the government in our communities. And if it's really about women's health, as the guy just claimed, then why not just give to a women's health clinic that doesn't offer abortion? Wouldn't that be a better option? I know that there's plenty over in California where you are, There's plenty of crisis pregnancy centers because we just had a lawsuit about that. So those businesses and organizations exist. If it's really about women's health, then just give to a organization that they'd be okay with. An organization that wouldn't have abortion as a part of the services that they're they're serving. The thing is, they don't want to do that because to them it's about political ideology. Look, this isn't the gospel. This is leftism shrouded in a very thin wrapper of Christianity. I mean, it's pretty clear to everybody that what's inside is not Christianity, if you know anything about the religion at all. But the point is they're at least trying to disguise it that way. They're doing a poor job of it, but it is there. You can put dog crap in a Twinkie wrapper. It's still dog crap. 
the wrapper doesn't change it. And this is the issue, and other churches have fallen into this too, not so much with leftist ideology, but with other ideologies. You cannot build a house without a proper foundation. They didn't start building this house, and I'm not talking about the physical building, I'm talking about the, the group of people there. They didn't build their faith on the gospel of Christ. They started with liberal ideology and started trying to wrap Jesus around it. That doesn't work. You have to start with Christ, and then everything else is secondary. Everything else surrounds that. I do have certain views, for example, politically, that have nothing to do with my faith. As much as I love capitalism, I don't think that my soul is going to be in danger if I were not a capitalist. I don't. I think that the system of capitalism can be a, a system where Christians can thrive, but that's not the reason that I support it. There are other political ideologies that don't have anything to do with my faith. I just think that they're good ideas. But when it comes to the gospel, that is the thing that you cannot compromise on. You have to start with that and then build the house. Because if you start with anything else, that house is going to be built on the sand. It is going to fall apart at the first heavy rain. And the same thing is going to happen with these guys. And I love, by the way, the dig at mega churches at the tail end there, because there's really barely any difference in this in a mega church. There's barely a hair's worth of difference in the ideology of these guys and your Joel Osteens. Not that I'm saying that Joel Osteen supports Planned Parenthood or anything like that. Don't, don't take me out of context. What I'm saying is the starting point for both is something other than Christ. With some of these mega churches, it's prosperity and feeling good. And with these other guys, it's feeling good and also liberal ideology. There's barely a hair's worth of difference in their ideology, to be honest. They may support some different things, but at the core, Jesus Christ is not there, and that's why the whole thing falls apart almost immediately when you had any scrutiny to it whatsoever. Just the slightest amount of rain brings that house crashing down. It may make you feel better, but that's not the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel is not to make you feel better, nor to advance your political ideology. It is to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ, and any ideology, any church that wants to do anything other than that is a church you do not need to be attending. You know, I'm reminded of a really great book, and it doesn't get nearly as much love as The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and I understand why. It, it, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is the best, but C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, the final book in that series is called The Last Battle. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, the last battle starts out in a really strange way. And without going into too much detail, there's a, a donkey and a ape, and they find a lion skin. And the ape starts running a racket and puts the donkey in the lion skin and impersonates Aslan. So... He waits until it's low light, and he doesn't have very many public appearances because he doesn't want people to catch on that this is a donkey, not a lion. But he keeps trotting Puzzle, the donkey, out and saying, hey, this is Aslan, and I'm speaking for Aslan, and anything that I, I'm saying comes directly from him. But see, there's Aslan, and now I'm going to explain to you what Aslan is really saying. This is what this guy is doing. He's the ape in that one, and I'm not saying that he's inhuman, I'm just using the analogy because that's the character in the, the Chronicles of Narnia. He's the one standing there, pointing to a donkey that is clearly wearing a lion's skin, as opposed to being an actual lion, and saying, that's a lion. He's pointing to something that is obviously not Jesus Christ, and saying, that's Jesus Christ. He's fulfilling that same role. And what happens is, as the story progresses, People start worrying about a great evil, a pagan god from the south in Narnia, called Tash. And eventually what happens, because he can't figure out a way to explain away some of the things that he's been talking about, the ape explains that Tash is Aslan, and Aslan is Tash because it's the only way that he can stay in power. It's almost a perfect analogy for what this guy is talking about here. 
First, he tries to tell you that this person that is clearly not Jesus is Jesus and saying that I get to speak for him and whatever I say, that's what he would really want. And then when he gets caught in his lies, he's basically presenting, well, the devil is, is Jesus and Jesus is the devil. It's all the same thing. It's all interchangeable. Yeah, Jesus would want you to have an abortion. It's the same thing that Pete Buttigieg does all the time. Basically, everything the Bible says is a sin is not a sin. And I'm going to step over things that the Bible obviously refers to as sin so that I can grab this one obscure passage and try to do about a thousand hours of mental gymnastics to explain to you how this thing that I don't like is a sin, even though the Bible never mentions it. You know, you really should like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. Oh, what's that? You want to know what's on the channel before you subscribe to it? Oh, no, no, no. It's like Obamacare. So you got to subscribe to find out what's on it.